This is Lecture 58E in the ABCs of Communism series of Bolshevism 2018. The Communist Party of the Philippines against Japan is our subject today. Uh, the invasion of the Philippines by the Japanese and General MacArthur's betrayal. The CPPI, that is the Communist Party of the Philippine Islands, had been told by the common CERN to pursue the line of anti-imperialist and agrarian revolution to overthrow the enemy as exemplified by the Chinese Communist Party. In the case of China, the CCP under the leadership of Mao Zedong conducted revolutionary armed struggle pursuing the anti-imperialist and agrarian revolution forging an effective alliance of the working class, poor peasantry, and landless agricultural workers. However, the truth was explicated about the World War II situation in the Philippines when the Communist Party was refounded in 1968, and I now summarize that understanding. As 1935 opened, unfortunately, the CP, uh, CPPI statements were just rhetoric. It declared it stood for overthrowing U.S. imperialism, the entire bourgeoisie and landlord class, and attaining what the working class had achieved in Russia. However, the CPPI did not fully recognize U.S. colonial rule and the chronic crisis of the semi-feudal economy as favorable conditions for armed revolution. And it was armed struggle that was the secret to success in China and should be in the Philippines. Instead, the CPPI conducted short discontinuous outbursts and uprisings easily quelled by the gringo colonial cops. About anti-imperialism, the CPPI competed with the Nacionalista Party and other bourgeois parties in verbal demands for immediate, complete, and absolute national independence with the legal and political processes of the U.S. colonial system. It did not do any analysis of the local bourgeoisie and thus could only engage in generalized anti-bourgeois and anti-capitalist rhetoric. Lacking an analysis of the local bourgeoisie, it had the sectarian tendency to close the door to the urban petty bourgeois, especially the intelligentsia, who were willing to remold themselves into proletarian revolutionaries. It failed to distinguish the middle bourgeoisie from the comprador big bourgeoisie. It denounced the populist and pro-Japan Sakatalista party as an adventurist for advocating and carrying out armed insurrection against the U.S. colonial rule, but it used its denunciations of this party to justify the foreclosure of revolutionary armed struggle. Concerning the question of agrarian revolution, the CPPI had no comprehensive grasp of how to carry it out by integrating armed struggle, land reform, and mass work, and doing so within the framework of the National Democratic Revolution. It praised for a short while the Taiyug present uprising against the feudal system and practices. However, subsequently in the entire decade of the 1930s, it sweepingly denounced as anarchist and adventurist all the armed peasant revolts that occurred in various provinces of Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. It rejected these to avoid justify avoidance of agrarian revolution and it regarded the communist Teodoro Asadillo as a renegade for trying in 1934 to wage an anti-imperialist and anti-feudal arms struggle in the province of Laguna. It also held the Socialist Party and the League of the Toiling Masses in English accountable for the spontaneous burning of sugarcane fields and killing of abusive landlords and accused them of being adventurous and even terrorist. Immediately after the U.S. colonial regime cracked down on it in 1931, the CPPI membership of 2000 abruptly shrank to only a few hundred. It was a membership with a generally low level of ideological and political consciousness and with no experience in organizational preparation against repression. The CPPI leadership had not yet applied Marxism-Leninism comprehensively and profoundly on Philippine history and circumstances. Accordingly, it could not define the character of Philippine society and the corresponding stage of the Philippine Revolution, nor could it comprehend the friends and enemies of the revolution, the strategy and tactics, basic tasks, and perspectives of the revolution. What was needed in the Philippine Islands was the strategic line 
a protracted people's war on the part of the Vanguard Workers' Party, with the CPPI recognizing that it was under the conditions of chronic crisis in a colonial or semi-colonial and semi-feudal kind of society, as its guiding objective understanding it could have developed the correct subjective lines on all ta tactical questions. Now, after the joint, negatives and positives, after serving their prison sentences, the CPPI leaders were banished to different provinces in the Philippines. They could have easily escaped their banishment and pursued the line of anti-imperialist and agrarian revolution. However, they did not. They preferred to be where they were banished, although they continued their links with the CPPI underground. As second-line leader Emilio McClung, who had studied in Moscow under the auspices of the Comintern, took the place of Evangelista from 1933 to 1935, he could not stem the weakening of the CPPI organization. Rufino Tumanda replaced him as general secretary from 1935 to 1938. Now, Tumanda had been a Filipino member of the CPUSA and had founded the Filipino Anti-Imperialist League in Brooklyn. He carried the endorsement of the CPUSA in Gringolandia, the Philippines, and the common turn. Nevertheless, he could not stop the shrinkage of the CPPI membership um, up to 197 during 1938. Now, the CPI membership, low as it was, still had its name and international support, and active party members within the KAP and KPMP. Now, these unions had wide influence in Manila factories and certain central Luzon towns, in addition, the CPPI led the League for the Defense of Democracy that had increasing influence among the urban petty bourgeois, especially the intelligentsia. Its core included a few university-based intellectuals, as well as Filipino members of the CPUSA, including Dr. Vicente Lava, who had returned to the Philippines. In 1934, the CPPI sent its delegation to the Seventh World Congress of the Comintern, and that sojourn was facilitated by the CPUSA. The delegation consisted of Lazaro Cruz, Martin Bautista, and Ramon Espiritu. Now, in 1935, the Seventh Congress, having been postponed, was finally held in Moscow and announced a new policy of building a united front of democratic forces to fight fascism. The Congress also approved the 1931 CPPI application for common turn membership. And in the meantime, because the Congress had been, had been postponed, the Philippines delegation had the opportunity to study for a year at the Communist University of the Toilers of the East. With membership approval having been granted, Lazaro Cruz stayed for a few more months in Moscow to learn staff work at the Comintern headquarters. Now, in 1935, five Filipino students went to Moscow, traveling through China, and then in Russia boarded the Trans-Siberian Railway. They were the last to go that way because of the Nippon imperialists unleashing total war against China. These five were Felipe Sevilla of the Tobacco Workers Union, Godofredo R. Bayare and Pablo Antonio of the KPMP, Primitivo Arroyo of the Dock Workers Union, and Fermin Rodillas from a cigarette factory. CPUSA cadre Isabel Arbach, wife of the writer Saul Arbach, a.k.a. James S. Allen, escorted the five. In 1937 and 1938, the Filipinos returned to the U.S. by the way of Europe. Along the way, the CPPI made a record of proletarian internationalism. It supported the revolutionary movements of the Indochinese, Chinese, Indochinese, Indonesian and Indian peoples against the colonial powers and their puppets. Filipino Chinese communists belonging to the CPPI either supported the Chinese Revolution from the Philippines or went to China to join the CCP and the People's Liberation Army. Filipino members of both the CPPI and the CPUSA joined the Abraham Lincoln Brigade to fight on the side of the Spanish Republicans against the fascist forces of Franco in the Spanish Civil War. Now, in 1936, the Popular Front, PF from here on out, was formed as an anti-fascist united front. Underground, the CPPI had a wider room for maneuver in the Popular Front, but the PF became too broad. 
thus what it included the Sacadalista Party and the National Socialist Party of Abilio Aguinaldo, it became preoccupied with electoral struggles. Running candidates against the ruling Nacionalista Party derailed the, derailed the real fight against fascism until 1938. Now, in 1936, Allen, or Arbach, went to the Philippines to oversee implementation of the Seventh World Comintern Congress, anti-fascist, popular front line. The Comintern Congress had directed him to work for the release of the imprisoned and exiled CPPI leaders and the legalization of the CPPI and explore the merger of the CPPI and the Socialist Party led by Pedro Abad Santos. At this point, Allen was placed under the command of the common turn secret, de secret department headed by Joseph Stalin. Stalin arranged for Allen to travel to the Philippines as a correspondent for the prestigious liberal U.S. magazine The Nation. From August to November 1936, Allen and his wife Isabel Arbach stayed in the Philippines. They knew very well the underground CPPI General Secretary, Rufino Tumande, who had been a CPUSA member in New York City. Tumande arranged the meetings with Crisanto Evangelista, Guillermo Cappadocia, and Mariano Balgos. He eventually organized a conference of 25 central cadres for briefing Allen and consulting with him about the situation, views, and plans of the CPPI. Tumanda and Allen developed the necessary working relationships with Pedro Abad Santos, chairman of the Socialist Party, and the Supreme Bishop Gregorio Aglipay of the Philippines Independent Church. On 20 September 1936, the CPPI Central Committee issued a manifesto entitled Forward for the Formation of the Popular Front. It called for an alliance of labor, farmer, and middle-class political and social groups who were in opposition to the policies of the U.S. colonial puppet government. In October 1936, a conference was held to organize the Popular Front. Unfortunately, the CPPI leadership allowed the entry of a hodgepodge of organizations from left to right, including pro-Japan and pro-fascist organizations. Allen had to be at fault for allowing this wrong notion that became manifest in the CPPI idea that what was needed was collaboration in electoral politics. Allen had a day-long interview with President Quezon, a gringo stooge if there ever was one, on a wide range of issues such as democracy, the fascist threat, social unrest, social justice, and independence. Allen did urge Quezon to release the communist leaders in order to strengthen national unity against the growing threat of aggression from Japanese fascism. Now, Quezon understood his ruling oligarch's interests, even if Allen did not understand what was best for his constituency. And he was at that time noncommittal about the release of the communist leaders. However, eventually, on New Year's Day of 1937, he used his presidential powers to release them through conditional pardon. Dumber than dog shit, the CPPI leaders at first refused to accept the terms of release until on October 16, 1937, they agreed to be released. Upon the request of the CPUSA, Quezon permitted Crisanto Evangelista to get medical treatment for tuberculosis in the Soviet Union, where he stayed for more than a year. On September 7, 1937, unable to grasp the reality uh, let's see, of U.S. colonial rule, the CPPI Central Executive Committee issued a statement declaring that the immediate recognition of Philippine independence would save the Philippines from possible invasion by Japan. The false prophet, James S. Allen, wrote an open letter to Socialist Party Chairman Pedro Abad Santos, published in the Philippine Herald on November 1, 1937, and in it he claimed the demand for immediate independence or U.S. agreement to such demand would be precisely the invitation to invasion by Japan. It served clear notice to the CPPI to direct its fire against the threat from Japanese fascism. On 18 August 1938, Allen went back, was back in the Philippines to oversee the preparation and holding of important gatherings of the CPPI. 
the CPPI Central Committee held a meeting on August 28th to 30th of 1938 to discuss and approve the two documents, Memorandum, Memorandum on the Chief Tasks of the CPPI and Independence, Democracy, and Peace. These declared that the central task of the CPPI was to organize a national democratic front against Japanese militarist fascism as the main obstacle to the establishment of an independent democratic Republic of the Philippines, it was decided that the CPPI disassociated itself from pro-Japanese uh, and terrorist elements to carry out the immediate and most urgent tasks of ensuring legality for itself and to convene in the near future an open Congress. Which brings us to the formation of the Communist Party of the Philippines on 29 to 31 October 1938. The third Congress of the CPPI was held with the theme for a National Democratic Front Against Reaction and Japanese Aggression and the theme of For Security, Democracy, Peace and Freedom. The Congress witnessed the CPPI emerging from the underground into legality. The CPPI accepted the USA Commonwealth Government, its Constitution, and the U.S. promise of independence to be granted in 1946. The Congress also served to merge the CPPI and the Socialist Party to become the Communist Party of the Philippines, CPP from here on out. It approved a new party constitution and elected a new Central Committee, which in turn elected the Political Bureau. The highest party officials were now Crisanto Evangelista as Chairman, Pedro Abad Santos as Vice Chairman, and Guillermo Cappadocia as General Secretary. By 1939, the threat of Japanese invasion was on everyone's mind in the Philippines. Japanese business and cultural organizations were loud and vocal with pro-Japanese Filipino comprador politicians, businessmen, and organizations conspicuous and alarming. Japanese aggression in China and against Indochina was a forewarning to all Asian peoples, including Filipinos. The Chinese residents in the Philippines were active in campaigning for support for China against Japanese fascism. The Spanish Civil War was also strongly felt in the Philippines as the Filipino-Spanish billionaire families of Rojas, Soriano, Ayala, Zobel, and Ortigas, and the Spanish-dominated Dominican and other fanatical Catholic orders provocatively sided with the Franco Falanges. Japan attacks the Philippines. Two months before the Japanese invasion on December 8, 1941, the CPPI Central Committee called on its organized masses to prepare for armed resistance. Stalin's Chica had warned them the enemy was at their gate. Accordingly, they had appointed a second line of leadership, headed by Dr. Vicente Lava, to assume the leadership in case the Japanese invaders killed the first line of leadership. Indeed, Chairman Evangelista, Vice Chairman Pedro Abad Santos, and General Secretary Cappadocia were soon captured in Manila by the Japanese fascists. Now, MacArthur abandons the Philippines. The day of the Pearl Harbor bombings had seen the Japanese destruction of almost, almost half of the U.S. aircraft based in the Philippines. Amphibious landings of Japanese troops along the Luzon coast followed. By late December 1941, MacArthur had pulled his forces back to the Bataan Peninsula. By June, or by the 2nd of January of 1942, Manila fell to the Japanese. Now, Douglas MacArthur was the son of Civil War hero and Medal of Honor winner Lieutenant General Arthur MacArthur, Jr. Douglas MacArthur had graduated at the top of the U.S. Military Academy class of 1903. He was an aide-de-camp to his father from 1905 to 1906 and to President Theodore Roosevelt from 1906 to 1907. During World I, he commanded the 84th Brigade of the 42nd Rainbow Division in the fighting on the Western Front. After the war, he served as superintendent of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and as Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. He made his biggest name for himself with his Bonus Army attack. Now, the Bonus Army was the popular name for some 17,000 U.S. World War 
one veterans and their families who marched in Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1932 to demand cash payment redemption of their service certificates. Walter W. Waters, a former sergeant, led the contingent. Now, many World War I veterans had been sent to the street after the capitalists started the Great Depression. The World War Adjusted Compensation Act of 1924 had awarded them bonuses in the form of certificates certificates they could not redeem until 1945. Now, each service certificate issued to a qualified veteran soldier bore a face value equal to the soldier's promised payment plus compound interest. The principal demand of the bonus army was the immediate cash payment of their certificates to 43,000 recipients. On July 28, 1932, U.S. Attorney General William D. Mitchell ordered the veterans removed from all government property. Cops fired on the encamped families and two veterans were wounded and later died. President Herbert Hoover then ordered the Army to clear the veterans' campsite. It was U.S. Army Chief of Staff General Douglas MacArthur who attacked the marchers, commanding the infantry and cavalry, and supported by six M1917 light tanks commanded by Major George S. Patton. The bonus Army marchers, with their wives and children, were driven out and their shoulders and belongings burned. Patton ordered the cavalry to charge them, which prompted spectators to yell, Shame, shame. After the cavalry charge, the infantry with fixed bayonets and tear gas entered the camps evicting veterans, families, and camp followers. The veterans fled across the Anacostia River to their largest camp, and Hoover ordered the assault stopped. MacArthur, however, chose to ignore the president and ordered a new attack, claiming that the bonus march was an attempt to overthrow the U.S. government. Fifty-five veterans were injured and 135 arrested. A veteran's wife miscarried when 12-week-old Bernard Myers died in the hospital after being caught in a tear gas attack. A government investigation reported he died of enteritis, and a hospital spokesman said the tear gas didn't do it any good. During the military operation, Major Dwight D. Eisenhower, later the 34th President of the United States, served as one of MacArthur's junior aides. Believing it wrong for the Army's highest ranking officer to lead an action against fellow American war veterans, he strongly advised MacArthur against taking any public role, saying, quote, I told that dumb son of a bitch not to go down there, he said later. Quote, I told him he was no place for the chief of staff, unquote. Despite his misgivings, Eisenhower later wrote the Army's official incident report that endorsed MacArthur's conduct. The hero of kill killing and brutalizing U.S. Army veterans and their families retired from the U.S. Army in 1937 and became a field marshal in the Philippine Army. MacArthur's job was to advise the Philippine government on defense matters and prepare the Philippine Defense Forces when the Philippines became fully independent, which was to be in 1946. The Philippine Army, almost entirely manned and officered by Filipinos, with only a small number of American advisors, was raised by conscription, with two classes of 20,000 men trained each year during, starting in 1937. In addition, there was a regular U.S. Army garrison of about 10,000 men, half of whom were Filipinos, for serving in the U.S. Army known as Philippine Scouts. It was at this time that MacArthur sold himself to the billionaire five families that ruled the Philippines. They did not want to lose their properties and control over the islands when the Japanese occupied them. These bosses now knew that that was inevitable, and they suborned MacArthur with a hitherto unheard of amount of money to act to do their bidding, specifically to retreat from Manila and declare it a free and open city when the Japs came. He agreed, and in the event, did his bid. Later, after the war, it would be these same families that used their now well-established relationship with him to take the lead in the reconstruction of Japan, more million, billions to be made. The world expert on MacArthur and his treacherous activities in the Philippines is Sterling Seagrave, who has written several excellent books about them. Anyway, in getting the Philippine Army ready for war, MacArthur faced an enormous task. 
On a visit to the U.S. in 1937, MacArthur lobbied the Navy Department for the development of PT small fast boats armed with tor torpedoes. MacArthur believed his PT boats were perfect for the geography of the Philippines with its shallow waters and many coves. The nascent Philippine Navy acquired three of these re remaining, uh, renaming them Q-boats after the Comprador President Manuel L. Quezon. In July 41, MacArthur was recalled from retirement to become commander of U.S. Armed Forces in the Far East, USAFFE. He was now a relatively young 61-year-old general, and he united the Philippine and United States armies under one command. In addition, in July 41, it became the policy of the U.S. government to defend and hold the Philippines. This was based, at least in part, in the belief that Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress bombers could deter or defeat an invading force. In August of 1941, the U.S. Navy created Motor, Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron 3 under the command of Lieutenant Junior Grade John D. Bulkley. It was a half-strength squadron with only six PT boats instead of the normal 12, numbering 31 to 35 and 41. It arrived at Manila in September 1941. It was understood that a fleet consisting of more than um, PT boats would eventually be required for a successful defense of the Philippines. On 8 December 1941, the Japanese invaded the Philippines. MacArthur declared Manila an open city and ordered his forces on Luzon to withdraw to Bataan. The Philippine government, the High Commissioner's Office, and MacArthur's USAFFE headquarters moved to Corregidor Island. Although the dependence of U.S. military personnel had been sent back to the United States, MacArthur was, until his recall from retirement, a Philippine government employee, so his family had remained in the Philippines. MacArthur's wife, Jean MacArthur, and young son, Arthur MacArthur IV, went with him to Corregidor. Most of the U.S. Asiatic fleet retired to the south of the Philippines. A small force was left behind under the command of Rear Admiral Francis W. Rockwell and consisted of the submarine tender USS Canopus, the submarine rescue ship Pigeon, gunboats Oahu, Luzon, and Mindanao, minesweepers Finch, Tonegar, and Quail, five tugboats, three small patrol boats, and the PT boats of Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron 3. The loss of Manila and the U.S. naval base at Subic Bay meant that fueling and spare parts became scarce. The PT boats relied on Canopus and the floating dry dock USS Dewey for assistance with maintenance. Despite this, Motor Torpedo Boat Squadron 3 continued patrolling. On 17 December 41, PT 32, 34, 35 rescued 296 survivors from the SS Corregidor, which had been carrying refugees to Australia when it struck a mine and sank in Manila Bay. A week later, PT-33 ran aground while patrolling south of Manila Bay and was set on fire to prevent her being salvaged by the Japanese, and PT-31 met a similar fate a month later after its engines failed and it drifted onto a reef. The PT boats attacked enemy barges off Luzon on the night of 23 January 42, a small Japanese warship on the 1st of February, and a small vessel, probably a fishing trawler, on the 17th of February. Then on 11 March 1942, MacArthur had radically overestimated his strength and has underestimated that of the Japanese. The Rainbow War Plan, a defensive strategy for U.S. interests in the Pacific, drawn up and refined by the War Department, required that MacArthur withdraw his troops into the mountains of the Bataan Peninsula. There they would await better trained and equipped U.S. reinforcements. Instead, MacArthur had decided to take the Japanese head-on and, having been badly whipped, ran for his life, leaving his men behind. Now, FDR could not tell the American people that MacArthur had abandoned his men and run off to Australia. So he covered it up, announcing that he had ordered MacArthur to retreat to Australia and prepare an eventual return and counterattack. He had MacArthur prepare a speech delivered by radio explaining he had been ordered to Australia by President Roosevelt to prepare the future campaign against Japan and that he would return. 
Meanwhile, the Philippine defense by MacArthur's men continued until their final surrender on the Bataan Peninsula in April 42 and on Corregidor in May. Most of the 80,000 prisoners of war captured by the Japanese at Bataan were forced onto the Bataan Death March. Their destination was supposedly a prison camp 60 miles to the north. In reality, it was an extermination march, as thousands of sick, malnourished men, weakened and brutalized, were killed before reaching their destination. Meanwhile, Quezon and Osmania left their men behind and fled to the United States, where they set up a government in exile. And the Philippine capitalists always served under the Japanese. Now, the Japanese military authorities immediately began organizing a new government structure in the Philippines with a Council of State to direct civil affairs until October 1943, when they created a puppet republic. Their puppet republic was headed by President Jose P. Laurel, but the Philippine capitalist collaboration in the occupation puppet regime began under Jorge B. Vargas, who had been appointed by Quezon as the mayor of Greater Manila before Quezon escaped Manila for Gringolandia. The only political party allowed during the occupation was the Japanese-organized Kalibapi Party. During the occupation, most Filipinos supported the U.S. against Japan. War crimes against the Philippines' population included the enslavement of large numbers of local women forced into prostitution for Jap soldiers, so-called comfort women, automatically put the Filipinos on the U.S. side. Now, the War of Resistance. The People's Army Against Japan, Huk Balahap, or Huk, was founded by the Communist Party of the Philippines, CPP, on March 29, 1942. It announced the creation of the Barrio United Defense Corps. The main leaders of the CPPI had not heeded much earlier urgings and warnings. For example, Comrade C and other Chinese comrades in the Philippines urged them to build a People's Army and incorporate the Chinese fighters, whose Wachi units would become well known. It would be in the course of fighting the Japanese occupation from 1942 to 1945 that the CPP would be able to develop armed revolutionary strength. It then conducted land reform, expanded its mass base, and established local organs of political power. Japanese occupation of the Philippines was opposed by this underground guerrilla activity. The Huck increased its power over the years and eventually they covered a large portion of the country. Opposing the guerrillas, the Japanese used their Bureau of, Const of Constabulary, the Kempitai Military Police Corps, there was a corps that was a secret police, and the puppet front organizations Makapili, or Patriotic Association of Filipinos, formed during World War II to give civilian support to the Japanese Imperial Army. In reality, 260,000 people were in Huck organizations, and perhaps one million civilians were the anti-Japanese underground. By the end of the war, Japan controlled only 12 of the 48 provinces. Throughout Luzon and the southern islands, Filipinos joined various groups and vowed to fight the Japanese. The commanders of these groups made contact with one another and reformulated plans to destroy Jap installations. When the time came, they would assist the return of U.S. forces to the islands. In the latter regard, they gathered important information for U.S. Army military intelligence. When I was at Fort Holabird for U.S. Army intelligence training school in 1960, I had the opportunity to attend a number of lectures by men who had been active field agents in this titanic struggle. As a matter of fact, at the time, I was regularly visiting Senator Frank Church, who told me that he had been in U.S. Army military intelligence in um, Borneo at that time, and uh, was also familiar with this entire uh, area. So, when I was, you know, that was many years ago, but in 1960, it wasn't, that was only 15 years after the end of the war. So you can see that, uh, that we had at our disposal field agents who had been active in the Philippines and Indochina. At any rate, patriotic Filipinos smuggled information to us and took our agents into enemy territory, territory over many months. In charge was Lieutenant Commander Charles Chick Parsons. His first task had been to smuggle guns, radios, and supplies 
to the Huck units by submarine. The guerrilla forces in turn made plans to assist MacArthur's invasion by sabotaging Japanese communication lines and attacking Japanese forces from the rear. Various guerrilla forces formed throughout the archipelago, including the U.S. Armed Forces Far East, U.S. AFFE, who had refused MacArthur's cowardly demand that they surrender when he gave Manila to the Japs. Several islands in Visayas had Huck guerrilla forces led by former Filipino army officers who patriotically refused MacArthur's surrender order, including Colonel Macario Peralta in Panay, Major Ismael Enginero in Bohol, and Captain Salvador Obsede in Negros. The island of Mindanao was farthest from the center of Japanese occupation. It had 38,000 guerrillas who were eventually consolidated under the command of U.S. civil engineer Colonel Wendell Fertig. Fertig's guerrillas included many North American and Filipino troops that had been part of the force on Mindanao under Major General William Sharp. When Wainwright had ordered Sharp's forces to surrender, Sharp refused. He was one of many Filipino and U.S. officers who refused to surrender. Their legal argument was that since Wainwright was a prisoner and under duress, he could not issue orders to Sharp. Some 200 gringos ended up in Fertig's guerrillas. As we have seen, the central Luzon area was the birthplace of Huck Balahop People's Anti-Japanese Army, organized by the communist Luis Taruk in early 1942. There, the Hucks armed some 30,000 people and extended their control over most of Luzon. Lack of equipment, difficult terrain, and undeveloped infrastructure made U.S. contact nearly impossible in 1942. So the resistance was on its own. In November 42, the patriotic Philippine 61st Division on Panay Island, led by Colonel Macario Peralta, was able to establish radio contact with USAF command in Australia. This enabled the forwarding of intelligence regarding Japanese forces in the Philippines to the Southwest Pacific Area, SWPA, command. Along the way, SWPA began to coordinate with the Huck High Command. Increasing amounts of supplies and radios were delivered by submarine to aid them. By the time of the U.S. invasion at Leyte, four submarines were dedicated exclusively to the delivery of uh, supplies to the Huck forces. And that brings us to a conclusion of this particular part of our uh, uh, series on the Philippines. And next we will deal with what happened in the Philippines after the end of World War uh, II.